Well, hey, everybody, Nate here. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Essential Craftsman podcast. I've got an interview for you today with Eric from Hand Tool Rescue. And if you're not familiar with Hand Tool Rescue, let me give you a quick overview. He's on YouTube and Instagram, and it's a, a channel and it's content dedicated to restoring old tools and pieces of machinery and not maybe not quite equipment, but tools. And it's just amazingly clever and satisfying and well done and the, the the tools he's restoring are totally unique and and tools that i've usually have never seen or heard of and it's just a real kind of fun way to identify and become familiar with old tools and equipment so i'm a huge fan as you'll see through the interview he's a really great guy i met him a couple years ago you've probably if you're on youtube a lot you've probably seen him in some crossover episodes with other YouTubers, and he lives in Canada, so he's uh, even in another country. This is our first international guest on our podcast. So without any further ado, my discussion with Eric from Hand Tool Rescue. For the listeners, we just solved my worst nightmare, really stressful and annoying technical difficulties, but we're 100%, and I've got Eric here. He's in his shop. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. So I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i given the listeners a background in case they don't know who you are, but I'm going to assume most of them do, but I brought okay. them up to speed, so <laughs> sure. we're just going to dive right in. Yeah, and, and uh my first question, talk, talk us through your thought process when you first started putting videos online a few years ago. Obviously, you had been restoring and fixing things longer than you were making videos, but right. talk us through that thought process of when you first started uh, filming it. Sure. So it was uh, more of a natural evolution and not necessarily a specific decision that I made at a, at a point in time. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I was restoring things as uh, a side hustle and and it's not... Ah. Uh, it's not as easy to do as the projects get more and more complicated. Uh, so I started taking photos like before and after photos and photos of where the parts were and, and, uh, and things like that. So I remembered where things went and then the photos weren't enough anymore. I needed to actually see myself removing a specific part wow. or fastener so i know exactly where it can place it back uh, so the thing is rebuilt properly and uh, that just kind of grew into well if i'm recording the entire process for my own personal uh, restoration needs then i might as well just throw that up on youtube with uh, with some you know editing and, and a little bit of effort at least. Uh, and then that just happened yeah. to catch on uh, like like crazy. And I it just started investing more time into the, the production and the, and the editing. I didn't want it to be, you know, horrendous. The, my first video was like the worst video I <laughs> hopefully will ever put out it in the sense that it's there's like a camera it was just my phone and all you hear is me like heavy breathing because the <laughs> the camera was at at basically mouth level but pointing down and i didn't understand the the audio issues like, maybe i should maybe i should edit that out you're kind of like what do you I, mean? I didn't know i didn't know how i just posted it <laughs> up and it's just like <sighs> like wheezing like a horrible human being so uh, I improved things like that over time. I'm gonna go watch that video. Oh, uh, duh, just just <laughs> disregard all all heavy breathing. Yeah, so I just improved the audio. I'm just kind of constantly improving over time. But it it really started because, huh. or I guess out of necessity, uh, yeah. Me and maybe my horrible memory is what really. And then there was the probably another transition where you, I'm guessing, at some point decided I'm gonna restore this item. And I don't maybe care as much if I sell it because it's going to be a fun video. So you kind of slowly maybe transition from worrying about the, you know, the whole right. side so, hustle of selling the item and just making an interesting video. Definitely. Uh, there are projects that are for me. Like there are tools yeah. that I am restoring for myself because I think they are 
so cool and interesting. So there's less uh, there's less pressure in terms of working with a, a client or a customer on, on uh-huh. what they specifically want or need or what to touch and not to touch. I get to make those decisions myself, which is really nice. Yeah. Uh, and that makes it uh, more fun, but I'm also uploading it onto the internet. So there's a, there still needs to be uh, a properly done. I'm not just going to be like, Oh yeah, just spray paint it over the dirt and we're done here. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, at, right now there's, a decent amount of um, restoration videos being put up by different channels. But I remember when I first saw yours, it, I, I kind of feel like um, it w- you may have been one of the first to really like focus on that. And I think, is that correct? Because at the, when I saw your channel pop up on my radar, I was like, it seemed like this incredible idea. I was like, oh my gosh, this is genius. <laughs> and then, but it, the nature of the video made it look like you'd been doing it for a hundred years, you know, with your, um, old workbench and everything. So yes. anyways, at, yes. at that time, I'm sure, is that kind of how it felt for you? Like this, there wasn't a lot of uh, there, other there, content like that? There definitely was not as much as there, as there is now. Uh, there were a few uh, other channels, not necessarily specifically about uh, restoring tools or, or things related to that as, as it's expanded now. Yeah, um, there were people obviously restoring things on YouTube for years, yeah. but uh, that kind of silent, um, yeah, only the the hands and and tool noises. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was definitely one of the first ones for sure. Uh, but yeah. it's it's crazy to see how it, it's grown. It's been impressive, impressive. It's almost like insatiable because I, myself too. I'll click. There's just unlimited interesting so things many, to restore yeah. it feels like a just a bottomless uh or m- maybe more like a wide open horizon of potential in other of words course. there's just unlimited room for for more of that oh yeah there are channels focused on restoring hot wheels wow uh, sp- specifically and, and only wow, i did not know uh, that uh, vintage huh. hot wheels and it's just as interesting the same kind of format uh, but like a lot of, a lot of fun just to see how that's done. Uh, wow, that's and, really that, interesting. and there's people who do toys and, and guns and watches like there's, there's everything for everyone. Um, have you ever, or I should say how far outside of tools have you branched? Have you ever done, dealt with old electronics or firearms or anything like that? Or is that kind of a whole different animal for you? Well, the real question is Nate, what is and isn't a tool? <laughs> there, there you go. Okay. That's the true question, yeah. right? Yeah. Like anything, I don't know, almost anything at this point can be a tool. Uh, yeah, even, maybe, maybe if, not a hot wheel, but... Yeah, well, if something does something, yeah, uh, yeah. That, <laughs> it's technically yeah. a tool. Like if it does work, you know, it's a tool. Even a hot wheel, like it rolls. So maybe... Uh, I yeah. could stretch that a little bit, yeah. but I still focus yeah. mainly on what you would call, you know, like a, a workshop or a trade level tool. Yeah. I have I have some toys lying around, like old tin cars and and things like that. That would be it. Would be kind of fun to get into that. But uh, the farthest I've pushed it were some nineteen uh, tens or twenties uh, headphones that I restored. Whoa. Uh, yeah, that, that one. Cool. That that was actually really cool. I really had a lot of fun with that one. And they work and I had to get a crazy odd amplifier to to get them to run. Wow. I had no idea. I didn't really know about audio uh, equipment, especially antique audio equipment. So, you know, those things, the impedance, so like the resistance. Yeah. It's like 8000 ohms. Okay. And a, a normal modern is like four to ten, maybe. So to find to wow. find the amplifier that would run that was uh, for a decent price, right? Uh, was difficult. And then the general restoration process, because the the speaker drums in the ear are literally just thin sheets of steel. Steel. Uh, so, so it just sa- it sounds very yeah. They were magnetic. It sounds very tinny, obviously. Uh, but surprisingly not, not that bad. Like you still had, you still had some bass in there. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. It was very neat. Very, very neat. 
You got any other electronic or uh, types of interesting items on deck like that? Are you going to do more of uh, audio like type things? Upcoming? Yeah. Um, in terms you're, you're probably of... have a huge junk drawer of like <laughs> things to restore, right? I don't have any audio stuff, although like uh, something related to Morse code would be neat. Oh, uh, yeah. Or something what? where I could actually plug in those headphones Yes. To something that was original to that era that those headphones were made. You need a ham radio, like an old yes. ham radio yes. Morse type thing. Yeah, I would love to do that because it, it didn't have, uh, you know, like one audio jack. Right. I just soldered on um, a modern audio jack so I could plug it, it into my phone. But it, it really, it had two, it yeah. had two leads, like uh, it, it had two leads, but it was still before stereo audio yeah. was created right. so it's not like left and right it's just the two leads interesting um, that power wow. so the radio would be would be something on on my radar that i need to find one uh that i i like the look of because there are a lot you know, out there you i bet you there's a ham radio guy maybe even on youtube or something who could really i find something that matched the the era of that you know like in, oh, for sure in this decade this would have been the radio for that, sure this would have gone along, gone along with, you know, you could probably yeah. find someone with some expertise there. Yeah. Like a 1920s era radio is all I, I need. Yeah. Really. Oh, or something oh, military really cool. might, yeah. might work as well. It's, it's yeah, neat. Okay. I'll, I'll get into more, uh, less like workshop tooly stuff. Uh-huh. If, if that makes sense. Like I got a 1920s pasta making <laughs> machine yeah. oh, uh, cool. that I'm working on. Uh, with this old Tony, actually. Oh, cool! Uh, it's, yes, so, oh, it's like a like a thing that like presses. Yes, and, and like you've seen the the hand crank, I like think so, yeah. the steel. They still make those, but it, it obviously looks different. But same uh, mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's something that's branching out a little bit. But I just I just find it interesting. Like if there's a crank and there's gears going, <laughs> I'm immediately I'll, I'm somewhere yeah. in the room. Yeah. Well, that's funny. You, you say, you know, what is a tool? Because obviously every one of those things is tools. But even as you said that, yeah. I was, I think we had just mentioned a watch and, I, you know, like almost by definition, that's a hand tool. Even It's even yeah. on your hand and it tells you the time. So there really is like no, um, you can distance. stretch it. Yeah. yeah. Stretch it's, it. it's one of those things like is a hot dog, a sandwich conversation <laughs> yeah. where there's yeah. no, you can't, you'll never saw. It's like you find out where everyone lies on the hot dog sandwich spectrum. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just exactly. just by talking it out. It's it'll be neat. No, I I, I'm excited to see whatever else I, I come across. Um, so do you have any like white whale tools that you're always on the lookout? You don't know if you'll ever find one, meaning to restore. Is there something that oh, you're just course. dreaming of like stumbling into someday? Oh yes. Oh yes. And what is uh, it? Or give us a couple. There okay. There are a few things, uh, and they're, they're getting larger. The, the, uh, the more time I spend restoring things, the more the white whale increases larger and larger in size. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> what I want is a Dell mag. So D E L M A G, um, power stomper, basically. So, so, so explain, uh, explain um, that. It sounds cool. So, you know, like a stamper, uh, that you would use to, to tamp the, the ground down yeah. after okay, whatever, yeah. whatever like process, a, like a compactor kind of thing. Yes. Um, okay. it looks similar to that. Uh, and you hold on to it with two hands, like you would uh, a modern day one, but what it essentially uses is it just basically creates like an internal explosion inside the chair and just launches once in the air and drops down. And it's like an insane amount of weight. It's just <laughs> like, it almost blows up the, the bottom ground. So it, and like, it's like, like a, a little 40s, internal combustion system. Yeah, it's that- like forties, uh, 1940s tool. It's just ridiculous. Holy Ridic- smokes. So I need it. I must find it. It's yeah. not it's not common at all. Um, yeah. that's one and I got I got two more for you. Okay, let's hear them. Uh this is one your your dad would enjoy personally. Okay. I think at least. So um I actually forget the name in German, but 
It's an automatic tree limb pruner slash cutter. Okay. Um, but meant for, uh, I guess, smaller trees. So <laughs> it's, think of uh, two, two half moons connected at a hinge, like a circle that's connected at, yeah. at one, at, and you open up the circle so it looks like a Pac-Man. Uh-huh. And then you put it around a tree trunk and you close it around that tree trunk. Okay. And there are wheels within that that cylinder of that tool that rotate it around and up the tree while oh. a chainsaw sticks out of the top of it. So as it's rotating, it starts cutting the limbs oh off the tree. <laughs> and how how are you holding on to this tool? Like two no, handles or no, something? Nothing. You just turn it loose. You turn it loose. There's there's a setting on the machine that when that cer- that cylinder reaches a certain internal diameter, like a minimum internal diameter, it will reverse direction and go and back, back down to the, the tree. So this is designed for trees that are still like in the ground, still, like still up and standing, down? still standing. And I'm oh and, and my just god, based on I don't based on how it functions, I couldn't see how if something was you know, larger than maybe three inches, it would just take too long that the the wheels would start spinning underneath while the chainsaw is taking time to cut through the branch. So it's for basically delimbing a a smaller diameter tree that hasn't, that is nice and straight and, and uh, easy to, to buck up afterwards, I guess. Unbelievable. Human ingenuity is just really impressive. I'll never, ever i'll probably never find one of those those they're german they were made i think in like the the 60s or 70s huh. and i've only ever seen like one online and uh, i most likely will not come across that I, I don't know you know there's probably several thousand of them sitting in people's garages right now yeah, that's also there. true you know what that's i mean true. and there's not a lot of guys like you who are like have that as their personal white whale so I, yeah I bet I bet we'll we'll find one for you at some point. It's we'll turn just, our people loose as well. I love that kind of just insane <laughs> solutions to things. Like, yes, this works. You're not wrong. Exactly. It's just why? Why? It's like, what's the best way to take the limbs off the tree? It's like probably send a chainsaw up there on its own. Yeah, automatically. Climbing. That is obviously the best way. Obviously the best way. <laughs> what if the mechanism fails? Well, it just flies off the top. Yeah, and then like, it, what are you talking the about? We got to get those limbs off. What, what are you talking about? Fall yeah, like off. as it gets to the top, the tree starts bending over <laughs> yeah. right into you know your family pool. No big deal. Yeah, and like you said, if the thing just comes down, it's like putting a chainsaw up that high in the air. I mean, on its own, is <laughs> amazing. What if the vibrations, you know, unlatch the yeah, the, and it's just yes. What a if death the chain machine. breaks and like whips off the, the nobody. Saw? Nobody needs to know. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. The final tool, White yeah. Whale, one second, which is also German. I don't know why these are so interesting to me. But German engineering. Yeah, they, they, a, they're the clever ones. Yeah, it's a hit and miss drivable bandsaw. Drivable like on a track, sort of? No, like it has wheels like a car. <laughs> it's from 1914. But with a bandsaw blade. With a like, bandsaw, just a, you drive this bandsaw to somewhere <laughs> to do something where someone didn't have a bandsaw. And it's got to wow. it's got to go like maximum 10 miles an hour. There's no, it's a hit and miss engine. There's no way this is going fast. Yeah. Uh, but that, that engine drives both the bandsaw and the car Holy thing. Holy smokes. It's nuts. So- so is the idea to just get the tool to the job to have a bandsaw or is it like you drive alongside a tree and I, like I don't no no it's not like uh it's not something that would cut down the tree it's something where you you just bring it's like a maybe a 14 16 inch bandsaw it's not large oh, okay. at all. Yeah. it's just like some your friend needs a bandsaw down the street so Got you it. just drive it, it there I, I don't know the maybe. use case. I really don't understand. I don't know. Maybe if like there was a sawmill, you know, and they had to kind of move it around depend on what product they're making. It's almost like a maybe, a, maybe for within one facility, it could be like more mobile that way. It just is so weird because I feel like the 
the cost of that, you could probably just buy three bandsaws in 1914. Yeah. Even and just back have then. Them and have them yeah. where you need it to be. And it's not like they didn't know how to move heavy things in 1914 or like no. loading tools was that's they they did that all day every day so that's yeah it's hard it's to imagine odd. i'm not yeah. exactly sure i'd love to find out more but uh huh information is very sparse on that kind of stuff and that's usually how it goes in terms of general collecting of anything yeah. it's that weird oddball unique you know they made three of them because yeah. the, it was a horrible idea. Like that's what ends up being <laughs> yeah. uh, the the most collectible. Yeah. It's funny. We get in the habit on the internet of like expecting to like find all the information about anything, anytime, at least I do. Yeah. But then there's these pockets of things like what you're talking about where it, nobody put information about those tools online. You know what I mean? No. It's like, it just it didn't happen. Same with photos and all that. Yeah. So, so it's probably tough to, to locate a hundred percent that's why uh do you know keith rucker yeah yes that's why his website vintage machineries.org or vintage yeah. machinery.org uh it's just it's literally a a, a human service <laughs> that, that yeah. he's providing because yeah. he is stockpiling every catalog every tool maker every company huh. every photo of every potential product they ever made is all there on that website for you to find. They have replication decals or decals. Um, yeah. You know, there's just everything on that site. It's really just a massive resource uh, for me when I'm doing research on wow. something that I've come across. But even that site and saying that is, is, uh, is still not, you know, the whole picture, of course. Yeah. It's only what people have submitted or what he's found personally. You know, to get really deep, you got to find those books. And and honestly, if I had access to it, the so the Smithsonian, yeah, has probably the largest record of um trade company catalogs. Oh. Uh, in the United States and, and probably North America. Uh, huh. m- so I would love to go there one day because whenever I'm doing research, I end up getting to that website and it's just like, yeah, we have it, but you have to come here and have a look at it. And I, I yeah. obviously can't <laughs> yeah, uh, because it doesn't exist anywhere else that I can at least quickly find. Mm-hmm. And in my, in my own books and my little tool book library, you know, I have a quick look, but rarely am I, am I lucky enough to, to come across uh, the solution there. Yeah. And what people may not realize, and I'm just realizing, but a lot of the things you're restoring at one time had schematics and drawings that could be a hundred, change everything 100%. for you. Just to, get, just to look at that one picture. Yeah. It's all I need. Yeah. That's why finding yeah, that's the, amazing. finding the patents are incredibly important to me. Uh, and I have, uh, not only do I, I try to find them myself, but I have a few people who will help me out with that, who either work in like a patent office or just have a, a kind mm-hmm. of, uh, interest in, in finding those patents because, uh, I would love to find every single patent of every tool I've ever f- restored yeah. or come across it. It makes things much easier in terms of my own restoration process. So but, how, um, how did you get into yeah. old tools and old machinery? Maybe just give us a little more information about your background. Cause you're not, you know, you're not an old retired guy. Those are generally <laughs> the guys more interested in, uh, old tools. So how, how did this happen for you? I, f- I feel like an old retired guy. <laughs> you will be. Someday. Uh, yeah. Well, hopefully. Um, so that's, that's interesting in, in it just kind of happened one day, much like the channel itself uh i moved to the city i'm in now saskatoon and i bought a house and it had a garage and i was finally excited to build out my workshop that i've i've been watching people on youtube have for Uh a few years before that and i wanted to get to making stuff and uh new stuff's expensive yeah and at the time it was much cheaper for me to get a 1940s table saw, spend a little bit of my time and get it running and 
now I have a table saw for, you know, half the price or a quarter of the price. Uh, it's getting more difficult now for sure. But uh, that's how it kind of started. I just started accumulating old tools out of the fact that I couldn't afford the new ones. Mm. Uh, but what I did, I wasn't really, there was still a part of me that didn't like basically anything made from the seventies on <laughs> there was something yeah. about the aesthetic or the, the build. Yeah. It was too similar. Like I'm not going to go and get a 1997 Delta table saw. That's the same, basically the same as what I yeah. can buy now. Yes, yeah. it is cheaper. And I could have just done that, but there was still something yeah. inside of me that intrigued me about the, the older stuff. And it might've just been the repairability. You know, this uh-huh. is, the materials used to make those tools are still very simple and easily repairable for me. Plastic, like I, I'm, I can't repair plastic really. Like you can glue it together. It's never the same. Right. Uh, you know, but with, with metal and wood, like I can work with those. Yep. So it just, maybe that was the part that drew me to it. I don't know, but what really got me addicted to tool history was I, I bought a hand plane off uh off a guy for five bucks and ended up being like an old stanley uh 1910s hand plane and i was wow. trying i was just trying to learn more about it you know how old was it and i had yeah. no idea that that there was a huge stanley collector's yeah. uh, community and they've actually laid out like you could date any Stanley hand plane at any time based on its external features. Um, and I ended up on that website. I'm like, Oh wow. It has the blade from, <laughs> from 1899, but the yeah. body is from 1927. And oh. for somehow, uh, or for some reason, I was just, that, that just hooked me immediately. I was like addicted wow. into finding tools and how old they were and how to fix them. It just, just something snapped basically. <laughs> something broke <laughs> yeah it's just this is like it's just a very interesting uh immediate addiction i kind of um assumed that you had come from a family of old tool folks like my me my dad's like been around old tools and so for me it's just kind of like well it's just yeah what our family's about my wife you know she joined our family and she just took her a long time to like, <laughs> it's yeah, like why is there so much it. Why are there so many old tools around your family? And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's Anyways, not um, even enough. There's not even so enough. So you you came tools. to it on your own. In other words, I got I sort of I got dropped um, in this world. But you you uh you suck yes, it out, it's definitely <laughs> odd when I explain yeah. it to people yeah. how I, I ended up uh, yeah, that's not doing what I this. Expected. But I, um, I just really enjoy it. Um, hey, separate question, and this is yes. almost like more family history question. But how how did how did you or your family end up in North Canada, the Arctic, freezing, <laughs> dark, this part of the the darkness. world? Um, give us like the quick version of how how you and your people are up there. Where it was below freezing right now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. What do, you, what do you mean by you people, Nate? Come on. <laughs> I mean the hand tool rescue family. <laughs> tool rescue. Um, so I initially moved here for work about uh, five or six years ago. Huh. Uh, I work as a uh, plant scientist at the university here. Oh wow! Uh, so completely and massively unrelated to yeah. anything I'm doing. What in the um, world? I'm, <laughs> I'm just a weird human being. That's amazing. Uh, so. Huh. Yeah, it it also helped, at least I, I enjoy working with my hands and uh, I don't get to do that necessarily, especially in the winter months, you know, just sitting in an office reading and writing and doing research and science yeah. papers. So I see. Uh, in the summer, it's fantastic because I'm, I'm in the field and, yeah, uh, you know, it's more hands-on, but yeah, there's also the kind of escaping from the office life that draws mm-hmm. me into uh, working with my hands as much as possible. Well, you know, Saskatoon's maybe not the best example, but sometimes I'll go on Google Earth or Maps, or I used to, not so much anymore. And you just look at little towns that are like way out there, like much farther than where you are. And you right. just ha- I just think like, what is it that like has brought and is keeping these people to yeah. these places that are so hostile <laughs> and so like... It, it's just hard to understand. And, um, 
I get that you know? a lot. No, I get that totally. A I, lot. I don't think Saskatoon's that way, but I think if you went another couple hundred miles north right. of you, oh. there'd probably be some villages that are easily that are more there's, that way. There's a place up north called Uranium City, which wow. uh, I'm sure you could figure out what <laughs> yeah. what they used yeah. to mine there. Yeah, uh, but they don't anymore, and oh. there are still people there. And there are no roads to get there. You have to you have to fly there. That's the only way. And there's still people in that. And they're town. still like they're still there. They're just doing Amazing. what they they got to do. So yeah, yeah but I don't know. Some people are just fine with it on some level. Like the summer here is still hot and and nice. And I know hot to to you is a little different. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, it'll occasionally, maybe rarely. Once or twice uh, an entire year get above, I guess, 100 Fahrenheit here. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, but it'll get warm. Yes, the summer is still warm, but uh, the winter is is very cold. It's like minus 40. Yeah. Well, uh, wow. Wow. And that's, the, that's the same, by the way, in uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit. That's where they meet on the scale. Is that right? I had no yes, idea. Now, Interesting. Well, now you know. Yeah, so, so the, it's very cold. cold freezing. <laughs> it's very, yeah. very cold for a long huh. period of time. But uh, it's also like the sunniest city, sunniest major city in Canada. Okay. Uh, yeah. With over 300 days of straight sun a year. Awesome. So yeah. the sun, I think, helps uh, everyone not immediately yeah. commit suicide. <laughs> well, and... That's obviously really cold and the winters are long and dark, but it's not like your life stops. You have this beautiful hobby in your shop there and are busy. Uh, everything's, and it's like, it's yeah, just a normal yeah, city just another otherwise. Day. Yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's fine. I'm, I'm busy. I'm more than busy. <laughs> yeah. I know people have the same, when I, I lived in Phoenix 10 years and this, and this, the, the sort of tone of that conversation is similar where it's like, what is wrong with you? It's like, <laughs> it would touch, it would touch 120 degrees once in a while, you know, every yeah. few years. And, okay. and it's sort of like, I don't know, it's hot. You, you, just, you just kind of, humans are amazingly adaptable, aren't they? You just sort of, I don't know, you just, it's what you do. It's where you live. It's Yeah, and at the end of the day, work. you're inside. Yeah, 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 you that's know, it. If I, if I was homeless, then yes, not the best place to be homeless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's fine for the most part. It's just uh, plug, plug your car in. Yeah. Your block heater at every yeah. possible occasion. Like when every I go can. to the supermarket, the stalls have the plug for me. Oh, is that? Every, wow. Every, yeah, yeah, so. Pretty much every major you store, you just, you have to. Interesting. And yeah, you're not, that, yeah. That. And seeing even diesel here would be less, less common. Wow. Because it's harder to start in the cold. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I got a couple more, a couple more sure. questions for you. Um, Shoot. Tell me. You're on several social media platforms in a pretty serious way. Do you have one that you really <laughs> like the most or maybe one that you really dislike the most? Or how, how do you kind of break down the different platforms that you're on and and what's your sort of off the cuff, uh, you know, sure. overview of them? Um, I, I get a lot of odd comments uh, related to this question. On both my YouTube channel and my Instagram page, which are really the the two that I, I focus on, okay, um, because they're so different. Yeah. Um, so on my YouTube channel, I ha- it's just it's silent for the most part. I've narrated a few videos, but it's silent. Uh, you know, just my hands working. It, it was all about. Uh, Basically, that was like the antithesis that sh- the, my video idea was the antithesis of what I was watching for so long, where someone would talk about what they're going <laughs> <Yeah>. to do <laughs> yeah. for three quarters of the video, and then they yeah. finally do it, and then it wasn't, they didn't explain it. But like, I, I couldn't stand that stuff anymore. So yeah, the point of keeping it silent was just, these are my hands and they're immediately doing the work yeah. and you're focused on me doing the work. Yeah. So that's, that's what the YouTube, uh, choice was. And the Instagram one is almost the exact opposite. I have me talking directly to, uh, the, the people that follow me through my Instagram stories that I am, 
updating every single day and it's like 500 little tiny Instagram stories every day. And it's just me huh. nonstop talking the about complete opposite of ins- what, insane of the- things going on in the yeah. workshop that I'm working on and all the problems I'm encountering and how I'm trying to solve them. And, Oh, look, I came across this new tool. Do you know anything about it? Or maybe I know something that I'm sharing with you. It's just total, total opposite. And I haven't really married the two mm-hmm. at, at all other than, uh, just offering narrated videos on Patreon where you get to see kind of my my thought process on mm-hmm. on why I made certain restoration decisions like oh I didn't repaint this one why why didn't I repaint this one got it uh, so th- there's probably a balance there between the two that would be a really good YouTube channel <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, in the sense that I, I do get a lot of questions about oh why did you do this why did you do that and when I have released the narrated videos people are understanding why I'm making those choices so uh-huh. maybe I can blend the two one day but for for now uh, it seems to be fine I really enjoy the Instagram stories because I can get that immediate feedback from yeah. from people. Uh, or do like a a quick poll on you know what color should this be or whatever yeah you know it, oh, it's yeah. a nice interaction whereas YouTube is more you just let it go respond to your comments and and just uh, uh, let it kind of exist and, and people find it however they want to find it yeah oh, so it's it's, it's a different approach yeah it's it's odd yeah it's sometimes I, you make an assumption about someone who isn't speaking in their videos like oh they're maybe shy or they don't want to show their face for some they're disfigured or something right. you know but it, it, you're the opposite because you're not disfigured. shy you have plenty to say I'm and uh totally you disfigured have, you only disfigured <laughs> yes uh, that's cool yeah well, i hope fully I hope you, get that yeah i hope you do kind of well I, I hope you don't change anything but if you did start narrating and putting more of that type of content in youtube i would right. certainly watch it because i know at least <laughs> for me i don't i i kind of I don't go on Instagram or other platforms that much. You know, it's like I I get YouTube a lot more. And so um, I, yeah. I don't actually catch most of your, any of your stories or any of that because I don't know yes, why. And, just... and it's, I could do that same, like you, YouTube has that Instagram yeah. stories feature yeah, and I could right. do that. It's just more that the, the people who are following the day to day restoration process are yeah. the ones who are, are super, super into whatever you're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah so it, it's sense. nice to to chat and have a conversation with them and you can share that that experience because they they also are either super into restoration themselves and they'll give you they'll be like oh you should use you know try this this paint it really matched amazingly when I was working on that tool and that's something I would have never come across otherwise like it's nice to talk to other people and have that forum that are yeah. in that same the same uh, kind of process that you're working on, so it does help uh, with the restoration process. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's nice. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Okay, well, um, maybe my last question is tell tell us about the your videos are different also because they're funny and they there there's gags and there's like just a lot of more to it than just the restoration. Not maybe every video, but. What's your like inspiration or thought process or talk, speak to that a little bit. Cause th- that is something that totally differentiates your content sure. from most of the other workbench channels in that way, at least. So sure. what, how did that come about? So, uh, I guess it's kind of a two part thing. The first part is like, that's just, that's just me. I'm never, I'm never that serious. Yeah. Uh, and, that kind of shows through, especially I, I don't have a, you know, list of jokes that I want to do. It just, I'm restoring a tool and something funny pops in my head because of what I'm doing. And I'll, I'll just do that quickly. But yeah, the decision to show that on YouTube is very much uh, on purpose. Yeah. And as and I did make jokes like immediately in the f- even the first video, there are jokes, but yeah, it, it was more. It's it's more to differentiate myself with uh. so many other channels that are now doing the same uh-huh. thing. 
you know, what is, why would you want to watch my video over someone else's video is, is the question. Uh And, and to add, you know, a little more entertainment is, is something that everyone would enjoy otherwise. So I didn't remove those jokes, uh, even though I could have, I'm just leaving them in there. Like, it's just, it's just fun to do. And I try to focus on tools that are fairly unique uh, mm-hmm. for that for that same reason i find it's just personally i'm making the videos more for me mm-hmm. <laughs> and someone out there that is exactly in my position right. which is is not the best way to be successful on yeah. youtube you know i'm making these videos for the one person who happens to find the exact tool and wants to also do a complete <laughs> restoration on it because yeah. why, why else would you take apart and show every single bolt yeah. and fastener? Like after you take out one fastener, like you, you get it. Yeah. Like you take the rest of them out. But so, you're showing but, it all. <laughs> I'm showing it all so that it's, <laughs> it's not lost. It's almost like a, I try to think of it like a, a patent, like a video patent model. Uh huh. Uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it so does. I do want to show every angle, every part, every angle of every part. I yeah. need to I need to make sure that this is recorded so we don't lose this because uh as you may or may not know, all like 90% of all patent models ever made were burned in a fire. I did not uh, know that. Yeah, it's a it's like a great great sadness in like 1830s and Whoa. 18 uh, 70s. The, the patent model building in New York City completely burnt to the ground. And there were only, Whoa. there's very few remaining. And they stopped requiring patent models after 1880. So yeah. that kind of early stuff that I do have, I want to make sure that I'm showing that because huh. uh, there aren't a lot of examples out there. And to have something in, in nice high definition and close up, I thought yeah. would be a, a nice kind of historical service, let's say. Yeah. Uh, so I'm making the videos for that, not necessarily to get, you know, an insane amount of views. I'm not clickbaiting like crazy. Right. I'm, I'm not doing what seems to now be the most uh, successful parts of a restoration right. video. And I find that interesting in, you know, you put something out there and when it gets popular, uh, the people that also start to replicate that further distill it down into uh uh, like its core essence of why people like and Uh view and click that video so over time that transition to that distilled Uh pure restoration video has been very interesting so it it really has become a lot Uh about um that transformation more than anything so they really want to see like the uh-huh. worst thing uh-huh. turn into the best thing. Uh, and that, and that yeah, is the, the captivating, that's the captivating thing that everybody wants. They want to see something that it literally doesn't even look like what the end product is going to look like. They want to see it uh-huh. shined up. They want to see the best possible, like essentially beyond, beyond original. Yeah. Uh, condition they want to see it just take that huge transformation and and it's cool to kind of see uh you know what it has i guess turned into over time and and where it's going who knows but uh it's very interesting to watch from my perspective at least yeah i bet it's like you said there's um it's a it's been distilled down to what the audience might or the the biggest portion of the audience apparently wants to see and that that hundred percent there are restoration videos with like 25 million views, which I will never achieve on one of my videos. Nope. In the sense that my videos are like 30 minutes long with yeah. no talking, right. you know, it's very, a very specific right. group yep. of people. You know, yep. when you are, when you focus on something very small uh, and you can get that video under 10 minutes and it's, yep. and it looks horrible right at the start and looks amazing at the end. Like you, that's, that's a more successful approach i think on youtube but i i that's not me yeah 
Well, that's really cool. Well, um, tell in case there were people listening who didn't know your channel, tell us all the uh, the locations. That's Hand Tool <laughs> sure. Rescue on YouTube, probably Instagram as well. And um, maybe tell us the quick on the out here about your wrenches and screwdriver on your website and give us the... <laughs> Sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any specific wrench screwdriver questions? Uh, I don't know. I guess what's the most pop? Yeah, I, I, I know. Originally, you had one. Then you had a mini and the regular. Now you have a large. Yes. Um, what's the <laughs> yes. What's the greatest hits or what's the fan favorite or what do you think is the most the useful fan? one? Um, those are all great questions. I I still believe the most popular is the original. Uh, yeah. This the six inch model. It seems to fit. I'm going to say most, most needs. Yeah. The mini, the mini one I personally love. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's a lot of fun to just play with and it's, yeah. it's a cool shape and the large one's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like it weighs like, like a weapon, two or three pounds and it's yeah. just, it's only nine inches, it's just solid, solid steel. And then <laughs> yeah. I had that, the guys at the machine shop surprised me with a big, like 21 inch wrench and it's, it's one, <laughs> It's one inch <laughs> thick. I wish maybe they'll be able to see this. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> and it functions. It's just that mind blowing. Amazing. It's so good, but it's so thick. It's so heavy. Um, <laughs> so I would love. I would love to make like a few of those, but they're like five hundred dollars in material yeah. and machining costs. <laughs> Uh, so those are a, a lot of fun. I, I love I love that stuff. And I uh, love the mini one. The mini one I've got two, one? and I yeah. I use it because it's it, I have it in my dirt bike toolkit because it's tiny. Yeah. I, ha- <laughs> I have one in my camera toolkit because it's yeah. tiny, and yeah. I, it's actually a really useful tool. I I love that thing. Yeah, I I love them too. What I ended up discovering about those and that specific style, and then what the changes that I made to it, but they're basically mini clamps. Yeah. Because when you clamp down with that wrench, you know, it can hang upside down yes. and stay fastened to the nut or bolt. Yeah. And it's not going to come loose and destroy your face. Yeah. Uh, and that that was advantageous to me during reassembly and disassembly of of tools because it's literally another hand. Like just hold this here. Yeah. Stop wiggling around while I turn the other yeah. end of the nut or something. So uh yeah, I do. I do really like the the style, of course, and the screwdrivers are the are the last, or not the last, uh, the latest in yeah, uh, in what I've been working on. But those are those are oddly more complicated, even though there are no moving parts. It's Is that uh, right. It's been a huh. long process. Like that, we developed that. It's been two years uh, working on that and trying to get it made in a way that is uh is going to allow me to sell it at a reasonable price for people amazing uh, uh, it's yeah. just not it's taken forever and that's it's been a lot of fun the whole small business entrepreneur aspect of what's been going on with uh the wrenches and the screwdrivers has been a lot of fun super rewarding too um but it just it just takes time. All that prototyping, uh, it's yeah, it's uh, it's getting yeah, there. It's almost like it's a like there. a service, like a service for your viewers and fans to provide yeah, it, those things it for just, them. It just takes <laughs> it's like I can you can obviously get anything made, uh, right? In terms of if it's a solid piece of steel, like we can machine pretty much any shape into stuff. Yeah, uh, but it's not it's not as simple as that. Like I, that would be a five hundred dollar screwdriver. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is not it's not okay so i need to get it to like <laughs> under 100 at the minimum uh-huh but yeah. i'm hoping to get like a 50 dollar screwdriver is as close as i'll be able to get i think yeah, yeah. Well, I, make them, I make them here in canada i don't yeah i don't make them anywhere else oh, that's really cool well um those are on your website handtoolrescue.com is that right uh yes they are if okay, so check people those can out. Check those out. They're really cool. They 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 seriously are like a. They're just cool. It's like yes, you can turn a nut with other wrenches, but when you have one of those, you you probably <laughs> use it like also like every time possible. Yeah, I so guess. I'm using. I, so I have the original, like the the the, the number one. one off the when we were designing. Oh, oh, oh the first I one. Use, yeah. I use that one in the videos. Yeah. 
all you know mainly as a way to kind of product test how long how much damage over time yeah. you know like i'd like to know and there's only one way of doing that and that's kind of real world applications that way so yeah i still use that one like it's it's been fine i'm, I'm happy um oh and tell us about your your podcasting and tell our audience where they can find you there and what those sh- what that shows about is there just the one uh, the fits all or is there uh, yes that? that's it okay. so there's the fits all podcast with uh jimmy deresta and andrew alexander who is uh blacksmith tools on instagram and we just essentially talk about uh, old tools and restoration and finding them and moving them and how to get yeah. the, how to find the the best locations and how to deal with the people. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot focused around that kind of antique tool world and and the people you kind of come across and yeah. In that, it's in that probably some space. real characters, I'm sure. And yes, and, yes, like some well it's basically like me. Like it's an insane <laughs> exactly. it's an insane human being that starts collecting <laughs> These these ridiculously murderous tools, <laughs> you know, like the drag saw and the swing saw, like your your dad would know and be like, yeah, these are for killing people. <laughs> like they don't, they're not really for cutting trees. Like it's yeah, just nuts. The, the, like you said, the type of people who collect and own those yeah, and value yeah, them, they got to screw loose. They're in, they're insane, like me. So uh, there's always interesting stories with those type of people. That's cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Eric. I'll put links oh, to all this you. in the description in there and sure. um good luck on your uh, future projects what what do you got on your bench right now this will be your last question what are you working on i'm currently working on uh simultaneously a swing saw which uh are you aware of what that is uh no uh it's a circular saw that swings on a pendulum towards you and away from you what the heck like wow. a a early miter saw yeah. Oh, I see. So basically, wow. a, basically a death machine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I also have a series of videos on YouTube where I remake a tool based off a a lost like patent. Uh-huh. Uh, so it doesn't actually exist. It was never put into production. Uh, but I just fully recreate it. Uh, you know, wow. one one time. So I'm working on Beautiful. a a uh, like a little hand plane. That is also a chisel handle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you could see why that was never put in production because to have a sharp blade in the handle <laughs> You're like is not blade. a good idea. It makes <laughs> no sense whatsoever. Not to mention when you hit the back of any wooden plane, like the blade pops out. That's how you get the blade out. That's why there's <laughs> marks on out. wooden planes. Like it's just <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just fun to do. So you got to make one. <laughs> That's what well, I'm working uh, on. Sounds good. Thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll uh, we'll catch you next time. For sure. Thank you again for having me.